I stare down at my shaking cartoon hands. They're red and swollen, and near the tips of my nailless fingers, the skin has turned blue. I try to form a fist, but my digits refuse. They curl up into a useless claw and continue to shiver. I try to remember what my living room looks like. I try to feel the soft carpet and the central heating beneath my bare feet, but I can't. I am no longer a man wearing a VR headset in the comfort of his own home. I am a cartoon character, beaten and frostbitten, shivering in a simulated supermarket. I cry out for Simon again, hoping that my ties to the world of the real haven't been completely severed. All that I am answered with is the gentle hum of the ever-present elevator music. I scream and my voice echoes through the impossibly long shelves of produce. I scream and I am hopeless, but then a cough rattles through my chest and my mind is seized by a primal force. I might look like a cartoon character, but the pain I'm feeling is real. I need shelter. I need warmth. I need medicine. Off in the distance, I see the red glow of warmth. Each step towards my instinctual destination is filled with agony, but the closer I get, the more my resolve strengthens. Beneath the droning elevator music, I can hear the burn of a heater. Before I get close enough to recognize the source of the warm light, I smell it. Rotisserie chicken. My fingers refuse to cooperate as I rip the bird carcass from its place, but eventually, to my great delight, I manage to get my claws into the oven. The warmth feels like a soothing balm on my flesh. As my skin turns hot and my hands pull away from the burning coils, another thought starts to sliver through my cartoon skull. I can't remember the last time I ate. My stomach groans with longing. The discarded rotisserie chicken has gotten intimately acquainted with a puddle of melted snow by my feet, but it makes no difference to me. I rip off its still warm flesh and stuff it into my mouth. Even past the numbness in my fingers, I can feel the grease. Even through my stuffed nose, I can smell the familiar mixture of herbs. Yet when I bite down on the digital bird, all I am met with is a hollow bite. I fill my mouth with meat. I consume an entire limb of the chicken. Yet my stomach still feels empty. The realization that I am unable to eat produces another scream from the depths of my throat. Along with my wails, chunks of cooked flesh leave my mouth. The hopelessness doesn't last long. Soon enough, my hunger is buried beneath more discomfort. I'm shivering. The snow has turned to water and mud and soaked through my clothes. Each step is agony. But I drag my cartoon body across the endless rows of cereals and hygiene products and batteries until I spot a glowing yellow sign on the horizon of shelves. Clothes and accessories, it reads. I make my way towards it, shedding my filthy rags like a worm forcing itself out of a cocoon of cloth. My cartoon body is genderless and sleek, yet my skin is reddened and filthy with exposure to the elements. Putting on fresh clothes, albeit virtual ones, makes me feel more human. The winter boots I snatch off the shelf insulate my feet, but it doesn't take long for them to get wet with blood. The fresh pair of jeans I pull on are reddened almost immediately. I do my best not to look at the wound on my leg. I do my best not to think about the logic of infections in this simulated world. I take a long sleeve white t-shirt off the rack and use it as a towel. Then I grab another one and don it. My body still shivers with cold and the black sweater I snag further down the aisle doesn't help much. I consider an additional layer of sweater but my cartoon eyes wander to something more appropriate. In a case all on its own. With a gentle golden light dividing it from the rest of the store, I see a dark blue heavy-duty winter jacket. It's covered in pockets, has the detachable hood, and looks like something an Arctic explorer might wear. With the memory of that frozen Soviet hellscape still fresh in my heart, I reach past the golden barrier and grab the jacket. The moment I grip the puffy arm of the coat, I nearly fall over from shock. Bright green neon letters flash before my eyes and swallow up the whole world. Please wait. Our virtual assistant will be with you in a moment. I scream in shock and fall into a display case of hats. Like a child hiding beneath a blanket, I shove my head into the jacket and hope to be spared from that blinding neon light. But the letters follow me into my hiding spot. Please wait. Our virtual assistant will be with you in a moment. 
Let us hold and shine and shiver in their brightness, but little by little they start to dissipate. Soon enough I am left with nothing but faint outlines of the words. Soon enough I am stuck in the darkness of a winter jacket with only my strained breathing to keep me company. Then a cheery voice breaks through. Hello, I see you're attempting to purchase a jacket that is also available as a special edition NFT. At no additional cost, you will be able to wear this jacket to your favorite virtual hangouts, concerts, and even some select multiplayer experiences. Would you like to purchase this jacket as an NFT? She stands above me with hazel eyes and perfect teeth, a fellow cartoon human. She wears the supermarket's signature blue vest and her name badge reads Sally. I beg her to let me out, to stop the simulation, to let me go free. I beg and reach out with my crooked fingers to the simulated cartoon woman, but she does not understand my pleas. She just blinks, waits for me to finish, and then says, Sorry, I didn't get that. Would you like to also purchase this jacket as a limited edition NFT? She blinks again, awaiting my response. Yes, I say, getting up. By the time I'm on my feet, the display case of hats is whole once more, as if I never fell. There's still a tightness in my jaw, but moments after I put on the jacket, my limbs stop shivering. Is there anything else I can help you with, sir? Nothing is more important than the satisfaction and well-being of our customers. She stares through me, but her voice is full of joy. Bouncing off of her optimism, I reach up to take off my headset. I hope. I pray that perhaps by interacting with another section of the simulation I could have broken my curse. Yet my hopes prove hollow. The moment my hands get near my face, my wrists go limp. Send message, I bark, clutching at straw. I want to send message to Simon J. Sorry, I didn't get that, she blinks. Would you like to hear about some of the special discounts we have on selected products today? Open developer tools. I yell, hoping that some magic combination of words will allow me to leave the simulation. Restart! Contact administrator! Emergency! Police! Email! Help! Help me! Sorry, I didn't get that, she blinks. According to our customer insight, you have recently expressed interest in rotisserie chicken. Would you, perhaps, like to hear about some of our discounted goods at the deli department? No. The sedated music keeps on playing on. The blood from my legs starts to soak into my fresh socks. Bandages! I need medicine! Her eyes snap shut and then slowly creep open as if she were waking up from a pleasant dream. The pharmacy aisle is stocked up for all of your medical needs. Would you like me to provide directions or would you like to be taken to your destination immediately? I can't walk. I point down to my crooked leg. The cartoon woman's eyes don't follow. She just stares at me with her immense smile. Her lack of empathy is uncanny. No problem. We are always happy to accommodate all of our customers' needs. Please take my hand and you will be transported to the pharmacy aisle. Her cartoon fingers are sleek and whole and mine are not. The moment my clawed hands touch hers, they stop shivering. For a brief moment, the universe focuses down on the embrace of our fingers. The rest of the supermarket fades away. The pain in my legs and my face and my back and my lungs fades away and all I am left with is the artificial warmth of her poreless skin. For a brief moment, I can feel my hands, my real hands, snared inside of sensor gloves. But after that brief moment of respite, virtual reality comes crashing back down. When we manifest in a pharmacy aisle, we manifest an inch above the ground. When my right foot makes contact with the tiled floors of the supermarket, I crumble to the floor in agony. The shop assistant just watches me writhe on the floor, smiling, waiting for me to finish. The pain does not subside, but my throat goes dry. When my screams finally come to a croaking end, the shop assistant blinks and smiles and says, Sorry, I didn't get that. If you need any more assistance, feel free to just shout the name Sally, and I will help you in any way I can. Whatever the customer needs, I am here to provide. I crawl on the floor, and she watches me. With a bright smile, she stares in my eyes as I roll up my jeans and blindly pour disinfectant on my wound. I am no longer laying on my living room floor. I am in the depths of some capitalist fever dream pouring hot fire on broken flesh. 
I crawl further and swipe bandages off the shelf. As I wrap the wound, I do my best to avert my eyes, but past the crimson of my cartoon blood, I see the jagged edge of bone. Moving it back in its place blasts away my sense of hearing and my vision. When the elevator music of the supermarket squirms back into my perception and the shivering blur of the medicine aisle sharpens, she's still there. Standing in the center of the pharmacy department, smiling at me from across the shelves of bandages and laxatives, I see Sally. I crawl until I find a shelf of splints. The one suited for a leg is on shelves high enough to force me to climb, but I persevere. Through his screams, I pull the splint over the bandaged leg and then, once my strength gathers, I crawl further still. Unable to reach any of the higher shelf painkillers, I settle for a bottle of ibuprofen. My frostbitten fingers struggle with the child lock and much of the bottle ends up spilled on the floor, yet a handful of tablets end up in my mouth. I cannot feel them move down my throat, but I hope they will eventually provide relief. The primal urge to ensure survival starts to wither. I am far too tired to plan or scavenge. I yell out Simon's name a couple more times. I reach for the place where the VR headset should be, yet my situation remains unchanged. Exhaustion sets in again, but this time I have no will to force it to retreat. I take off my NFT jacket and fashion it into a pillow. The sleep I sleep is dull. I rest in a fevered state between waking and dreaming with only the tired notes of elevator music as my compass. I see glimpses of life beyond the headset. I see sunny summer afternoons with friends and guitars. I see flashes of hikes, of Christmas, of family, of love. Drifting between dreams and the virtual world, I see glimpses of a life beyond the headset. I find myself strolling from a mall in the late 2010s. My heart is heavy with the loss of a dog and a particularly nasty job interview. I roam through the mall trying to make peace with a reality that feels far too jagged. There's been little time in my life for video games, but I've always held an interest in the medium. Passing by a video game store, I decide to catch up on the hobbies of my youth. The top seller of the week seems to be some game about hunting robot dinosaurs and I see plenty of reanimated corpses of the franchise as I played as a child, yet the shelves don't hold my attention for long. My eyes latch onto a hint of color in a sea of earth tone cover art. A juicy poster of bright dissected fruit stands in the center of the store. In front of it sits a headset and joysticks. I ask the acne covered clerk whether I can try the VR setup. She shrugs and goes back to texting. I don the bulky helmet and travel to a world much less jagged and sad. Everything is colorful and loud and happy. I have no legs or arms or face. I am nothing but a shining samurai sword. Below me, a tranquil blue sea shimmers. Above me, the sun shines. I am nothing but a shining samurai sword and all around me flies colorful fruit just begging to be sliced apart. Each cut of my sword is rewarded with bright numbers that add up on the scoreboard in impressive speed. The berries are filled with rich goopy juice that explodes with each swing of my weapon and when I manage to slice through multiple pieces of fruits, fireworks bloom on the horizon. I forget about my dog, I forget about being unemployed, I forget about the windy day outside. All I can think is, how can I make a living doing this? My cartoon eyes bolt open to the glare of fluorescent lighting. My limbs are numb from sleep and painkillers and my throat is parched. The unbearable sting of thirst claws from my tongue down to the dry depths of my stomach. A couple rows of skin creams and sleeping aids away stands a fridge with drinks. Its gentle cool buzz calls out to me like a siren in a salty sea. Without uttering a sound, I climb to my feet. My steps are slow, but they are slow with purpose. Each footfall still makes me wince, but I do not scream. I grit my teeth and I focus on the approaching salvation. When I touch the handle of the fridge, my eyes start to tear. The cool air coming from the machine. The delicious drops of condensation crawling down the sports drinks. With my priorities simmered down to nothing, I feel like a man in heaven. When I tilt back the cool bottle of energy drink, I cry tears of joy. It feels like, for a mere second, 
I can taste the electrolytes, but reality soon follows. My mouth is still a burning desert of dried spits. No matter how much I drink, my thirst cannot be satiated in the virtual world. Blue drink spills all over my new sweater as I scream in frustration. Again, my clothes are soaked and in front of the refrigerated machine my body starts to shiver. I close the cooler, walk away from it with steps that make me curse and try to make sense of my chances of survival. I am a bruised cartoon man limping through a virtual supermarket, but I am also a man of flesh and bones standing on soft carpet in a cozy living room. It is not the cartoon man that is thirsty. It is my flesh and bone body that needs to be satiated. There's no telling how long I've been stuck in a simulation, but I know I won't last long without food or water. I try to remember the layout of my living room. My prolonged stay in the world of the virtual makes that a difficult task. I can loosely imagine where my television and couch are, but the rest of the space feels like an abstract illusion. It couldn't have been longer than a day since I saw them, but I fail to remember the color of my walls. I shake the nostalgia for my old life away and get down on my knees. My cartoon hands push around sticky tablets of ibuprofen on the supermarket floor, but faintly, ever so faintly, a universe away, I feel the strands of my soft carpet. Somewhere by the sofa, right by the lamp table, I recall a bottle of water. I pick the direction which feels right in my gut and I crawl towards it. Through my crawl, I overturn a shelf of vitamin pills, but to my delight, my hands the universe away, find the outlines of a couch. I let out a yelp of happiness and found my way to one end of the couch. There is no bottle of water there, but there is also no lamp. Adjusting my mental map of the living room, I make my way to the other end of the couch. When I get to its edge, I gently wave my hand in the general direction of where I think the lamp might be. I find it. I find it considerably closer to my hand than I presume that I send it crashing down to my living room floor. What I do not find is the bottle of water. My journey to the edge of the living room was barely possible in the confines of the supermarket aisles. An attempt to enter my apartment kitchen is out of the question. I am left in a pit of thirsty despair. As any semblance of hope for survival starts to leave me, I lie down. I remember the freezing world where I had met the horrible egg creature that caused all of my suffering. I imagine myself lying in the snow watching the life leave me like puffs of steam from warm flesh. I cry, I scream, and then, when I have no more thoughts to think, I start doing snow angels in the sea of loose vitamin pills. My right thigh brushes up against something. Somewhere far away, in an incomprehensible dimension, my right thigh brushes up against a cylinder of plastic. Immediately, my hand sees it. I bring up the object to my ear and shake it about to hear its contents. Joy seizes me when I hear the swish of liquid and my heart almost stops when my wrists go limp. The bottle rolls on the floor but I leap on it like a blind starving animal. Working the lid of the bottle makes my fingers feel like they're on fire but eventually the top of the bottle loosens. The far off hiss of escaping gas makes me doubt the contents of the bottle but I drink it regardless. It's cola. It's cola and the bite of the sugar and the fizz of the bubbles feels like an assault on my tongue. But it's a drink. I gulp on the bottle and try to focus on the fact that it's a liquid rather than thinking about the caramel pinch crawling down my throat. I gulp at the bottle and lose myself in the sheer ecstasy of thirst satiated. When the bottle of cola is nearly empty and my hands raise above my head to drain it faster, the thought doesn't even cross my mind. My wrists go limp. What is left of the cola spills across my body. I manage to salvage a little bit of liquid from the bottle before it spills entirely, but it is a meager amount. Still, I find myself smiling at the simple prospect of not dying of thirst. I sit on the overturned shelves and try to assess the state of my body, but before I can make a conclusion about my legs, I am overtaken by another burst of joy. Uh, Matt? Hi? Can you hear me? It comes from above, like the voice of God. I scream yes, like a raving maniac, I yell at the sky and beg Simon to let me out of the simulation. I promise him anything, everything, I beg with such ferocity that my sentences lose all structure, but my pleas 
are not understood. Darn, um, okay. Looks like this only works one way. Can't hear you at all, Matt. Simon's voice booms through the supermarket aisle. Uh, but at least you can hear me. That's great. Look, there's been some, uh, developments. I stand up. Somewhere past my ragged form, it feels impolite to sit. The pain in my right leg is present, but manageable. I make notes to grab some stronger painkillers. So, uh, I have no idea what sort of program we're dealing with here. Whatever a bug you were experiencing in this Eggman simulation transferred over to the next project in your workload. It might be a virus, or honestly, it might just be coincidence. I've spent a couple of hours with the code, and it's complete chaos. Constant randomization keeps self-updating. It's, well, it's unearthly is what it is. Not even really sure how we're communicating right now, but at least this works. Things are uh, mighty confusing, but at least there's some good news. He pauses. I nod my head and smile as wide as I can. I want to hear the good news. I throw thumbs up into the air and yell, but I get no response. I stand there in silence, gazing at the fluorescent light-covered sky, awaiting good news, but none come. Well... Simon's voice finally booms. It's not really good news, it's just news. Corporate registered the complaints and responded. Not that it's particularly... His voice trails off. The lights on the ceiling start to burn my eyes. I walk back to my jacket and retrieve it off the floor and load a pack of sleeping pills and painkillers into its pockets. As I grab emergency supplies, I notice that Sally has gone missing. Sorry, I was just checking up on something. Simon's voice echoes through the infinite row of aisles. So, uh, management seems to have quarantined our testing pod. It means they know something is up and actually read the report. I was a bit worried they were just shutting us down to avoid a problem, but uh, I see that they have already sent someone over to help. I look around, as if expecting to see a friendly smile, but not even Sally Sola's grin is around. I shake my head at the fluorescent lights. There's no one else here. Huh. That's strange. Let me just check. The voice fizzles out. I'm left alone. Even the ever-present elevator music seems to have faded away into a static hush. Another glance through the aisles just makes me vaguely aware of which direction the exit is in, but I am still certain I am alone. I look out into the human rows of chips and wine and razor blades and hope for supernatural aid. Can I get some help, Sally? I ask. The moment the name leaves my lips, I go blind once more. Our virtual assistant is dealing with another customer right now. Thank you for your patience. The hot green letters are such a shock to me that I go crashing into a shelf of sun lotion. The rack smashes into the shelf across the aisle and sends bottles of creamy liquid sprawling over the floor. It's only once all the clatter calms and the neon letters fade away that I hear it. I hear a familiar voice. I do not know where you have heard that name before, but I promise you, if you ever repeat it again, I will physically destroy you. I am Professor Egghead. This is the title I am known under now, and this is the title I will be known under until the sun ceases to burn. Remember that, Salili. Through a gap in the shelf, I see Sally's lifeless grin. The moment I see who she's talking to, I get hit by another rush of adrenaline. Without a second thought, I start limping towards the exit. I feel no pain. My being is wholly focused on moving as quickly and as quietly as possible. I'm sorry for the miscommunication, Professor Egghead. Your customer profile has been updated. Knowing the customer's preferred name and pronouns is important to us, and we promise to do better next time. Your recent shopping trends include dog food. May we offer you a 20% discount on a 30-pound bag of healthy puppy- I have not come here in the search of dinner. I have come here in search of spies. A curious little explorer broke into my laboratory and escaped with scientifically invaluable knowledge that cannot fall into the enemy hands. Have you seen him? The tunnel of shells vibrates around me as I make my way to the exit. Above me, the fluorescent lights flicker, plunging the red exit sign in and out of darkness. 
Daghead's voice, his mere presence in the simulation, spreads a manic energy through the world. Sorry, I didn't get that. You expect me to repeat myself? A stomp shakes the supermarket. The fluorescent lights fizzle out and the world is plunged into darkness. I have lectured within the depths of underground libraries. I have single-handedly solved the question of whether tomato is a fruit. I have debated with astronauts on the moon. I will not repeat myself to the likes of you. I will find this spy on my own. The lights above scarcely flicker. All that remains is my guiding light is the burning exit sign. Behind me, I can hear the pitter-patter of flat feet. Somewhere out in the darkness surrounding me, there's another sound, a set of sounds, the shivering of metal, the squeaking of wheels. Hello? Deg-shaped creature calls, approaching my position through the darkness. You know you can't hide and you know you can't run? Tell me where you are and I'll take you back where you belong. I might even forget how angry I am about you disobeying my scientific decree. The exit is still impossibly far away. As I shuffle towards freedom, I hear more and more agitated metal in the distance. Through the darkness, in between the aisles of the supermarket, objects fly, leaving behind echoes of crumbling tin roofs. You cannot escape your destiny. I have chosen you as my scientific assistant. And that is what you will be. You will help me observe the unobservable. You will join me on a journey down the cruel gullet of knowledge. You will do as you're told, and you will do so with the zeal of a young Newton. I have chosen you to aid me in my scientific pursuits, and you will. You will be my humble assistant because no one escapes the company of Professor Egghead. The fluorescent bulb snapped back to life with the blinding tenacity of a spotlight. My vision scarcely clears when I am knocked to the ground by a rogue shopping cart. The metal barrow flies into the air and lands somewhere out of sight. My right leg sends another torrent of unrestrained agony shooting through my throat. Oh, hello! There you are. There is my scientific friend. The malformed scientist aggressively prances through the supermarket, spilling goods off the shelves with joyous giggles. I try to crawl to my feet, but the assault by the shopping cart has stripped me of any mobility that rest provided. I crawl on the floor like a wild animal, trying to escape the inevitable. There is no escape. There never was. And there never will be. The egg-shaped nightmare screeches. You are in my world now. And in my world, my word is law. Come. Come. Enough time has been wasted. It is a sin to spend this much time outside of the laboratory. Come! Come! There is science to be done! Leave me alone! I scream, looking into the monster's crust-filled eyes. I do not want to be your scientific helper. I just want to go home. I want out of this stupid simulation. My words freeze the egghead in his tracks. He stands just a couple of feet from me. But the demented grin disappears from his stretched out face. All that remains is a bizarre, grotesque expression of bewilderment. Do you not want to join me in my fight for a more educated tomorrow? Do you hold no love for the realm of science and research? Daghead's tired eyes burrow into me. His voice loses all trace of energy and joy. Do you want to be my scientific friend? No! I scream at the nightmare. No! I want to go home! I want out! Please! I don't want to spend another second in this world! Please, Professor Egghead, let me leave the simulation! A brief smile appears on the Egghead's face when I say his name, yet it soon falters, leaving behind nothing but the brown gunk of spits on his thin lips. 
Professor Egghead is scarcely wrong in judgment of character. Professor Egghead has always found pride in his ability to smell out the aptitude of science. His wobbling advance resumes. Egghead no longer prances or shoves goods off the shelves. He simply wobbles towards me, his lips in a tight gunk-filled frown. The smell of sulfur on his breath is undeniable. Professor Egghead scarcely makes mistakes, but Professor Egghead is a scientist and scientists cannot deny the facts. I thought that by showing you my research, I could facilitate a grand partnership of knowledge. Yet I was wrong. Professor Egghead was wrong and now it's time for him to make amends. From inside of his filthy lab coat, defying the laws of physics, Professor Egghead produces a colorful mallet. At first, the object seems innocent enough, like something from a cartoon, yet the closer the nightmare gets, the more I can smell the noxious fume escaping his mouth, the clearer it becomes he is holding a deadly weapon. On the edges of the bright mallet, there are traces of his previous work, blood and viscera and clumps of hair. You have seen too much, and when a civilian sees too much science, precautions must be taken. In the name of science, I declare you a spy. Spies with functioning frontal lobes cannot be allowed to live. Daghead raises his gore-covered mallets and prepares to deliver the killing blow. I beg for forgiveness. I cry out for Simon, yet all my pleas do nothing to waver the egghead. His eyes are bloodshot and exhausted and there is a manic force behind them. When the filthy weapon finally descends, I shut my eyes and force out one last cry. Sally! A flash of blinding light. My body goes completely numb. My nerves tingle with a restless sleep and when they finally awake, when my hands start to feel, it's not the supermarket floor that they touch. Beneath my fingers are the soft threads of carpet. The skin around my eyes is irritated by sweaty plastic. Somewhere beyond my window, an ambulance passes. The sirens get swallowed up by a metal rattling. The soft carpet of my living room floor is replaced by the wiry cage of a shopping cart. My body is uncomfortable and old wounds are starting to make themselves known, but I'm lying in a shopping cart rolling towards the exit. Physical assault, be it off customers or by customers, is strictly forbidden in both our real and virtual locations, Sally says, towering over the egghead professor. I do not see her face, but the cheeriness has completely dissipated from her voice. The virtual shop assistant speaks with a threatening firmness reserved for dimmer establishments. The, the customer's, customer's physical safety is sacred during, during the shopping process. process. Our store has a zero-tolerance policy towards violence, and in accordance to that policy, you will now be asked to leave the store. Do you have any idea who you are talking to? My theories have been compiled in tomes. Nobel Prize winners scream my name from their sleep. I am the greatest mind known to man. I am the supreme philosopher of science, Professor Egghead. The scientist stomps his stunted limbs once more. The shelves shake and scatter and turn over. The wheels of the shopping cart jump from side to side, nearly spilling me out along the way, and the fluorescent lights flicker like fire, but one thing stays constant. The burning light of the exit sign. It grows red and true, and beyond it there is a poorly rendered parking lot. I am ungovernable. My scientific mind refused to be constrained by your vulgar laws. I have committed research in markets all across the country and have received medals for my service. Don't ever ask me to leave a store again and get out of my way. I should be in my laboratory, working on invaluable research and not screaming at a dullard in a supermarket. Professor Egg. The mallet hits her in center mass, severing her top half from her bottom half. Her cartoon body turns to a piñata of photorealistic viscera. I am too close to the exit to be sure, but even from a distance, I see the cheery grin hasn't left her face. No one stands in the way of Professor Egghead. No one rejects the Egghead. 
No one can escape the company of Professor Egghead! He wobbles through the gore, and he keeps on wobbling. Turn your vehicle around this instant and come back! I refuse to waste more of my precious time on this wolf and rabbit game! The wheels of the cart quiver one last time and then stop. The thought of trying to negotiate with the egghead again rumbles through the insane recesses of my mind, but one look into the low polygon parking lot provokes an entirely different course of action. Out by the blocky copy-pasted cars and square greenery, I see a familiar shape. As if cut out and pasted into a wholly different world, I see a familiar telephone booth. I grab a hold of a nearby shelf and push my way towards the exit. The egghead's legs are short, but he's moving at a steady pace. As I wrap my cartoon hands around the edges of the supermarket exit, I can hear his phlegm-filled wheezes. They disappear the moment I pull myself out into the parking lot. The push was meant to give me enough speed to reach the phone booth, and it does that and more. I hit the booth in a head-on collision. I feel no pain as I scramble to my feet. All I feel is the blood in my ears and the sweat on my back. Unsure of which parts of my body are still whole, I swing myself into the phone booth and pick up the receiver. The egg-shaped maniac waddles his way across the parking lot, but he's too slow. No one can escape the company of Professor! At first, there is nothing but the metallic hush of static. Then, slowly, ever so slowly, I hear a voice emerge. Ma. Ta. O. Oh. Ha. Eh. The syllables echo through the nothingness like ancient prayers, yet beneath them, comprehensible speech starts to rise. Matt. Can. Me? I try to look towards the source of the sound, unsure if I even have ears to hear with or a head to move. I don't. My digital counterpart is floating nothingness, yet the voice strengthens. Matt, can you hear me? I raise my arm, or at least I do somewhere off in the living room with soft carpet. I try to wave. At first only harsh static comes in reply, but soon I hear Simon. Ah, good, great, okay. Going to move you somewhere a bit more normal so we can talk. Uh, I think I know a way we can get you out of here. The static disappears in one swell pop, and I am transported into the middle of a conference room. I drop on top of the long mahogany table, and before I can even register my new environs, the shopping cart drops on top of me. The trolley is heavy, and I feel like screaming from its trauma, but instead, I look out of the window. Beyond the plexiglass, a majestic snow-topped mountain towers. It helps me process through the pain. So, good news, bad news, Matt. Simon's voice booms in my ears. I think I know how to get you out of the simulation. Thing is, it's going to take some creativity. 